To enable human settlements on Mars in the years to come, one of the crucial steps is figuring out how to launch large numbers of people into space. But since the retirement of the Space Shuttle seven years ago, an average of just 13 people have gone into space in any one year, with only two vehicles currently available for astronauts, the Russian Soyuz and China's Shenzhou. But this situation is about to change, as a race to develop new human-rated vehicles, not between nations, but between private companies, is entering its final stage. So in this Mars update, we're going to be taking a look at the progress of NASA's commercial crew program, as both SpaceX and Boeing vie to become the first company to launch astronauts to the International Space Station. I've also got the latest updates for you on the development of SpaceX's next generation Mars vehicle, the Big Falcon Rocket, or BFR. A true paradigm shift in human spaceflight is on the horizon, so let's dive right into it. If you want to access the International Space Station today, the only option is via the Russian Soyuz rocket and spacecraft. This system has proven remarkably reliable over the past 50 years, but in spaceflight, there's little more troubling than a potential single point of failure. So in order to guarantee a continued human presence in space, it has therefore been a pressing concern to close the redundancy gap left by the retirement of the Space Shuttle in 2011. Motivated by this, NASA contracted two companies in 2014 to develop human-rated spacecraft, SpaceX and Boeing. Under NASA's commercial crew program, each company must conduct two demonstration missions to the International Space Station, the first one uncrewed and the second with crew on board. For these missions, SpaceX have been developing the Dragon 2, or Crew Dragon, whilst Boeing have been developing the CST-100 Starliner. Following each capsule's completion of both demonstration missions, they would then be officially certified for crewed flights and begin six contracted operational missions to transport astronauts to and from the International Space Station. When these contracts were awarded four years ago, the first flights were expected by the end of 2017, but earlier this year the official target dates were updated to August 2018 for each company's first demonstration mission, with November and December penciled in for Boeing and SpaceX's second mission respectively. Though this later set of official dates will also be missed, the two companies aren't too far behind with some really exciting hardware progress being seen as of late. I'm going to focus primarily here on the development of SpaceX's Crew Dragon, because Boeing's Starliner program, whilst making progress, has been comparatively quiet on public updates as of late. But I will note that Boeing do currently have three Starliner spacecraft at various stages of development, and currently appear to be targeting October for their first demonstration mission. Over the past few months, SpaceX have made some very prominent advances in preparing for their uncrewed demo mission. In May, the Dragon capsule for this mission was placed in an anechoic chamber for electromagnetic interference testing. Chambers like this one have walls lined with material to absorb both sound and electromagnetic radiation, resulting in a shielded test environment. This is ideal for studying how the electrical systems on board respond to both internal and external electromagnetic stimuli. Having cleared the anechoic chamber testing, in June the Dragon was sent to Plumbrook Station in Ohio, home to the world's largest vacuum chamber. At the in-space propulsion facility, the full Dragon was immersed in a vacuum chamber that accurately simulates both the thermal environment and the vacuum expected on missions to the International Space Station, including the extreme temperature variations from the 90-minute day-night cycle experienced in low Earth orbit. These tests were completed over a period of just two weeks, after which the lower trunk of the spacecraft, which will contain vital flight hardware, such as solar panels and radiators, was transferred to SpaceX's factory in California for outfitting. Meanwhile, this month the Dragon itself arrived at Cape Canaveral in Florida for final preparations for its upcoming flight. Good progress is also being made on the rocket which will launch this Dragon for the first demonstration mission. This Falcon 9 booster is currently expected to finish construction shortly and ship to Texas for test firing in around a week's time. So with all the successful Dragon capsule tests, 
and the rocket that will launch it coming along nicely, when might we finally expect to see the first Dragon 2 mission fly? Well, this is an area that's somewhat beyond SpaceX's control, as it depends in large part on the International Space Station's existing schedule. For example, a Japanese resupply vehicle is due to arrive in mid-September and stay for 59 days, during which time astronauts on board the station will be occupied with unloading the supplies aboard. It also doesn't help that a crew rotation will be taking place from mid to late October, resulting in a temporary reduction in the space station's permanent crew capacity from 6 to 3 astronauts. In short, Accommodating the 14-day Dragon 2 first demo mission in the late September timeframe, whilst possible if SpaceX is ready, could prove logistically difficult for the space station. However, we won't have to wait too long for an official launch date, as the United States Vice President Mike Pence is due to announce new launch dates for both SpaceX and Boeing two weeks from now on August 3rd. After both companies have completed their first demonstration mission, there are still a few additional hurdles that need to be overcome before crewed missions can commence. On SpaceX's part, they still need to construct a crew access arm at Pad 39A for astronauts to board the Falcon 9, which on Boeing's side at Space Launch Complex 41 has already been completed. However, Boeing is still lagging behind SpaceX on demonstrating Starliner's abort system via a pad abort test, a feat that SpaceX accomplished all the way back in 2015, and they're actually planning to top that with an in-flight abort test in a separate flight prior to demonstration mission 2. Although navigating such a labyrinthine network of certification requirements must seem to require some bureaucratic wizardry, the end goal of combining NASA's decades of experience in human spaceflight with the innovation of the private space industry, will see the birth of the safest human-rated space vehicles ever created, and the lessons learned from this experience will be incredibly beneficial and transferable to the next generation of spacecraft, which will be used for the first missions to attempt landing people on the surface of Mars. Speaking of which, I'm sure you're all keen to hear the latest news on SpaceX's BFR. In the last Mars update, I spoke about SpaceX's plans to construct a BFR factory at the port of Los Angeles, the construction of which is anticipated to take at least a year for the first phase, and an additional year for the second phase. Since my last update, the large tent nearby, which hosts the main BFR carbon composite manufacturing tooling, has been seen to feature a new support framing to allow the tooling to rotate on its axis, as it will when carbon fibre is woven around it to make components for the BFR. Whilst it's not currently known whether the tooling has been used in practice yet, one very promising sign that work is progressing on this front is that SpaceX recently posted the first job advertisement specifically to work on building the BFR. In particular, it's interesting to note that the posting specifically lists experience in composite materials and welding techniques for the BFR. Coupling these developments with statements from SpaceX's Vice President of Propulsion, Tom Mueller, that the first full-scale flight version of the Raptor engine that will propel the BFR is currently being worked on, it is becoming increasingly clear that SpaceX have begun repositioning their research and development resources to focus on the BFR. Yet another promising sign that SpaceX are serious about their target of conducting the first hop tests of the BFR spaceship in early 2019 was the arrival of a liquid oxygen fuel tank at SpaceX's upcoming launch facility in Texas. This 360,000 litre, or 95,000 gallon tank, contains about half the volume of liquid oxygen the BFR spaceship would require, and will likely soon be complemented by further tanks, including liquid methane tanks, to support propellant loading operations at the site. It's probably too early to say at the moment whether SpaceX truly are on track for hop tests of real BFR hardware early next year, but a good indication of this will probably come in an update Elon Musk has planned for later in the year. I'd personally be quite excited if this involved revealing the first composite components 
manufactured using the new BFR tooling. But as tends to be the case, I'm sure Elon will have something both surprising and wonderful up his sleeve. Finally, I stumbled upon an unexpected piece of BFR related news a little closer to home recently. Earlier this month, Myself and many other exoplanet researchers from across the globe gathered in Cambridge in the United Kingdom for the Exoplanets 2 conference, where we spent a week hearing about some of the latest discoveries in our field. In the final talk, we heard about NASA's proposed Louvoir mission, the Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Surveyor. This would basically be a multi-purpose astronomy and planetary science telescope, serving as a supercharged version of Hubble or James Webb, with a notional launch date of around 2035. In the talk, we heard about how NASA's Space Launch System rocket is currently being considered as the primary launch vehicle in a Block 2 configuration, but here's where it got interesting. In the questions following the talk, the speaker was asked why NASA doesn't simply consider commercial rockets, such as SpaceX's BFR, for the Louvoir mission. Her reply was incredibly interesting. Namely, that NASA has been considering both SpaceX's upcoming vehicles and similar vehicles being developed by Blue Origin for this mission, should the SLS Block 2 not be available in time. I followed this point up with the speaker afterwards, and she told me that NASA have actually already funded a study on launching Louvoir with SpaceX's BFR. The fact that a potential multi-billion dollar NASA flagship mission can now seriously be talked about launching on the BFR is a strong and powerful indicator that people in the space industry are beginning to take the existence of this rocket seriously. And I think that's a great sign for the future. For with each and every incremental step along this road, the rocket that may one day enable people just like you and I to go to Mars is moving closer to reality. Before I sign off, I'd like you to cast your imagination forwards and imagine living and working on Mars when there is a community of a thousand people living there and regular flights to and from the Earth. Because the topic of the next live stream on this channel is going to be Martian society. So if you have a moment, I'd be really curious to hear your perspective on how you would structure such a society on the Red Planet. What kind of job could you see yourself doing on Mars? How should the colony be organised? And how should it be governed? I'd like to keep this as open-ended as possible, really. So the conversation could go in many ways. Let me know your thoughts down below, and I'll use them to shape the discussion in the Martian Society live stream next month. Until then, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching everyone, and please do let me know if you have any feedback or comments. And to make sure you don't miss future Mars mission updates, hit subscribe and then click the notification bell in order to catch all the latest news on our journey to the Red Planet.